Now that I've finished Prey, I feel like I know enough about the game in order to start playing Prey. During my experience with the game, I started realizing I was actually really frustrated, dying very quickly in fights with only one or two enemies, using my glue gun, wrench, and pistol for every conflict with less than ideal results. I was brute forcing my way through the game, and I kept getting a feeling that there was important information that I had missed out on somewhere. There were examples of this being true, but what I found, as I passed the halfway point of the campaign, is that I wasn't engaging with enough of Prey to find the game fun. But this shouldn't have been the case, right? Going into it, I knew that it was an immersive sim, so I was expecting to see a lot of stim and response stuff going on, which I did. I paid attention to the way it excellently introduced new gameplay elements to the player, and was in awe of its masterful, dense, interconnected level design. I picked up on a ton of references it made to other games in the genre, including System Shock 1 and 2, Deus Ex, Bioshock, Arx Fatalis, and even Looking Glass Studios itself. Uh, though that one's a bit, uh, blatant. Prey looks to be the immersive simiest immersive sim that ever did simulate, and you'd think that would be a perfect thing for someone like me, but there was just something about this game that made me feel like I was being kept at an arm's length. It should not be this hard to love this game, but it is. Why? Answering that turned out to be really complicated, so I ended up splitting this look at Prey in half. In the first part, we're going to cover the game's systems, and then hyper-focus on Prey's first couple of levels, trying to figure out what the game could have done better to prepare the player for going forward. Then in the second part, we're going to do a walkthrough of Shuttle Bay, experiencing it playing as a player who is a little more in tune with the game's intent, and then wrap up by trying to figure out the game's design philosophy. Oh, and there's some uh, spoilers, and I'm not equipped to remove neuromods, so treat them as permanent. This one's gonna take a while. Uh, well, let's start with the basics. The player uses WASD to move, the mouse to look around, space to jump or to mantle over objects, control to crouch, hold shift while moving to sprint, Q and E to lean, F and sometimes G to interact with objects, and V to toggle the flashlight. The left mouse button lets the player use their currently equipped weapon, and later on, the right mouse button allows the player to use a Psy ability that they've equipped. Uh, more on those in a bit. Using the mouse wheel brings up weapon selection, which pauses time while the player's in that menu. From here, the player can map specific weapons and side powers to the number keys, allowing them to use those to switch tools instead. The player can also press I to access their inventory, M for a map of the area, O for objectives, J for research conducted on enemies, and N to see neuromods, or the skill trees. In the bottom left of the screen, the player is going to see two, and then later three, bars corresponding to their health, which keeps them not dead, armor, or suit integrity, which protects them from certain types of damage, and psi, which is used for, well, psi abilities. Not surprisingly, there's a number of items the player can get to replenish these, with med kits, suit repair kits, psi hypos, and various foodstuffs, like coffee, ramen, and nutritious nuts. Floating around levels, however, are certain NPCs called operators, which the player can interact with to replenish these. Medical operators for health, engineering operators for suit integrity, and science operators for psi. In about the first hour of playtime, the player also gets a propulsion system to assist them moving through space. While falling, the player can hold spacebar to slow their fall. It only has a limited amount it can use, but it recharges once the player is on the ground. As basic as it is, it's still pretty expressive, allowing players to either glide across gaps, use a short burst before hitting the ground to negate fall damage, or some combination of the two. This becomes a necessary tool when traveling outside the space station, repurposing Q and E as keys to roll left and right instead of leading, allowing the player to orient themselves in any direction while floating around. The player exits the space station through a number of airlocks in different levels, needing to open them from the inside. As they do this for more and more airlocks, taking spacewalks becomes a more viable path to go between points on Talos 1. That is, except for when the game relocks all the airlocks for plot reasons twice. 
Though going outside the station is the most obvious example of near weightlessness in the game, there are areas inside the station, like a section in the deep storage level where it's experienced as well. The player gets access to a number of tools and weapons, such as a wrench for melee, because of course, as well as a typical pistol and shotgun. But come on, this is a sci-fi game, where's all the crazy weapons? The most iconic to come out of Prey is the glue gun, which shoots a lump of adhesive that becomes solid on contact. Using this, the player can create platforms wherever they want, slow down enemies, or use it as a sealant and extinguish fires. Much like the rope arrow in Thief, glue is a really fun way to have the player move through the environment, but because of that, there needs to be some restrictions as to how it's used. First, glue can't just stick to other clumps of glue, it needs to actually be stuck to another surface. Second, that surface can't be glass, which in a space station with giant ass windows is a pretty smart restriction. Other weapons include a disruptor stun gun, which zaps and stuns enemies and even deals a good bit of damage to robotic enemy types. There's the Q-beam, a heavy weapon that builds up a charge on enemies, causing them to explode when it reaches their health, and a foam dart crossbow, which can actually be used to hit buttons and computer screens. Even though it's hilarious that a nerf gun is already this useful in the game, it can also be used to distract enemies or take care of some particular types called cystoids and cystoid nests. That's about it for... firearms, aside from a special golden pistol that I never got. But the player also has a number of throwables at their disposal. The EMP is probably the most conventional, stunning and damaging electric enemy types, but other than that, grenades aren't your typical explodey kind. There's the Typhon lure, which attracts the Typhon, or alien, enemy types to its location, allowing the player to lead them into traps set up ahead of time. Psychic enemies can have some of their abilities temporarily disabled through the use of a null wave transmitter, and the recycler charge damages everything in its radius including enemies, and turns it into materials for crafting. And there's not too many enemy types to speak of, actually. The most common, and coolest in my opinion, is the Mimic. They'll look for a relatively small physics object in the environment and copy its mesh, allowing it to hide in plain sight. If the player gets too close to them, they'll undisguise themselves and attack, but if the player can pick them out while they're camouflaged, they can land a sneak attack for more damage. Phantoms are much more humanoid in appearance, and once the player starts seeing them labeled with human names, it becomes apparent that it's not a coincidence. Regular phantoms shoot blasts of kinetic energy at the player and can quickly dart from side to side, making keeping track of them kind of a pain in the ass. There are specialized types of phantoms as well. Etheric phantoms can make clones of themselves, poltergeists are invisible but can only make an area that pushes the player upwards, thermal phantoms can set things on fire, and Voltaic Phantoms can zap the player and actually disable electrical devices nearby. The thing about Thermal and Voltaic Phantoms, though, is that they also deal damage to the player if they're close enough, which dissuades melee combat, but can also be frustrating because it's not really communicated all that well visually. You're not looking at your tiny-ass health bar in the middle of a fight, you know? Occasionally, the player will encounter cystoid nests, which can be ruptured with a single hit. Doing so, however, spawns a number of cystoids, which move around in clusters and are similarly easy to kill. Both serve as sources of radiation, so it's best to dispose of them from afar. The player can use their pistol or shotgun to do so, but the cystoids and nests will detonate after being hit with almost anything, including glue and foam darts, so it's better to use those and conserve bullets. There's also several flying Typhon enemies, those being the Weaver, Telepath, and Technomancer. The Technomancer floats around creating electric attacks and is able to hack devices to fight alongside it. The Telepath is similar, except it shoots psychic blasts and takes over humans, forcing them to run at the player and explode, which, uh... Ugh. Weavers are a little more complicated, but their presence is always telegraphed by Coral, this yellow webbing they create. Before they can be damaged, Weavers have a shield that needs to be disabled with a solid hit but when it is, they emit a roar, temporarily giving the player the fear status effect, which makes aiming a lot harder. The weaver will then attempt to regenerate its shield by moving into a tuft of coral, and will spawn a number of cystoids if the player gets too close. Lastly are the robotic enemies. There are some corrupted operators that can show up that will attack the player instead of performing their usual restorative function. A little past the halfway point in the game, though, military operators start showing up as well. 
These, along with things like turrets and keypads, can be hacked if the player purchases that skill. Basically move the cursor through the maze with the WASD keys under time pressure and hit the right button when you're in the target to confirm. Sometimes you need to do it multiple times, enthralling I'm sure. If the player is able to do this with hostile operators, it'll switch their alliance to be friendly and attack other enemies in the environment. Oh yeah, there's this uh, other enemy type, um, the, uh, the Nightmare. Um, after a certain point in the game, an enemy called the Nightmare has a chance of spawning. Being two stories high, having a copious amount of health, and shooting blasts that can home in on the player, it's certainly as intimidating as its name suggests. Whenever it spawns, though, it also has a timer, meaning the player can either attempt to kill it or wait for it to despawn when the time hits zero. In theory, this idea sounds pretty great. Experiencing it in motion, however, it has a couple of hitches. Uh, first off, when I encountered the Nightmare, it was as I entered crew quarters for the first time, and being the seasoned immersive sim player I am, immediately turned around to exit. On loading the new map though, I noticed that the Nightmare's timer was still ticking, and for a second I thought, oh shit, it can chase me across maps? And uh, no. No, it can't. I found out later in the game, however, that certain quests have a timer attached to them, and if the object is halfway across the space station, then the timer needs to be able to operate globally, so this just seems to have been reused for the Nightmare itself, which has its own quest pop up whenever it spawns. My initial response was to say, just make the timer only apply to the level the Nightmare's in. However, there are some questions that would be prompted by such a change. If the player backed out of the map, like I did, would the Nightmare just immediately despawn on exit? If not, if the player exited the map when the Nightmare had 30 seconds left, then tooled around somewhere else for 5 minutes, and then re-entered, would there still be 30 seconds left on the timer, or would it reset? because neither feels particularly intuitive. Alternatively, the game could have opted to actually have the nightmare transition across levels to chase the player, but I can immediately see the can of worms that would open up. If this were the case, could other enemy types chase the player across maps as well? What happens if the player has so many enemies chasing them into a new map that the AI starts to take up too much performance? How would you visually represent enemies entering and exiting the area? Thinking about the alternatives, I can kinda get why Arcane made the decisions they did, but the end result of exiting the map and waiting out the timer being a legitimate strategy is less than satisfying. When playing through Prey the first time, I had largely avoided the psychic skill trees, which we'll talk about in a bit, so my experience with the Nightmare was disappointingly limited to it randomly spawning every now and again on level load. On my second playthrough though, when I recorded most of my footage, I started going for these skills a lot more, and as it turns out, this drastically affects the player's encounters with the Nightmare. First, the more psychic abilities the player purchases, the greater chance the Nightmare has of spawning to the point where it can just start doing so in the middle of a map. Second, right after a player purchases a psychic skill, there's a chance that the Nightmare will spawn immediately after. This is way more interesting, because not only does this add consequence and risk to <laughs> purchasing a skill upgrade, but it makes an enemy's spawn rate affected by other gameplay systems, and I find that fascinating. These developments only highlight my other issue with the Nightmare, which has more to do with the level design itself. I'll expand on this later, but the main reason I turned around when seeing the Nightmare while entering a space is because it was a completely new level to me. I didn't have enough time to get a sense of the layout, and seeing that thing come after me before I was even able to form a plan just made me want to flee. Yes, perhaps there's a way to design layouts to be more accommodating of the systems as they exist, hint hint. If you want a better chance at withstanding these enemies though, it's best to beef up your abilities with some neuromods. Neuromods are basically just upgrade points. You need different amounts to purchase different skills, and all but the initial skills have prerequisites, meaning you need to purchase other skills before unlocking new ones. The skills themselves are grouped together with the roles describing them pretty well. The security tree is about strengthening the player and dealing more damage. The engineering tree is all about interacting with hackables and upgrading weapons. And the scientist tree is about psi abilities and being a fucking nerd. 
What's interesting is that the other three trees are hidden until a specific point in the game when researching enemies becomes available. It's kind of like in System Shock 2 when the exotic weapon skill doesn't become available until about halfway through the game. Again, these are unlocked with research, which doesn't become available until the fourth level Psychotronics, when the player obtains the Psychoscope. Pressing Z to toggle it on and off, the player only needs to look at an enemy for a few seconds to gain a research point for that enemy type. To gain more research points, the player is going to need to find another instance of that enemy elsewhere. Accruing research points unlocks skills in the three trees revealed later in the game, with these skills being themed around the Typhon themselves. Actually, it starts getting a little more specific than that, and this is where it starts getting really cool. Specific upgrades are more closely associated with specific enemy types. So, for instance, researching a Voltaic Phantom, an electrical variant of the Phantom enemy, will expose the Electrostatic Resistance skill, reducing damage the player takes from electrical sources. However, researching enemies also unlock specific Psy abilities, like the Electrostatic Burst ability, which also comes from Voltaic Phantoms. But what's really cool is to realize that these abilities aren't just random-ass mechanics the player obtains, but are the very same abilities that the AI is using against them. You can actually see this idea in Arcane's first game, Arx Fatalis. See, players can engage with magic in that game by drawing runes, with specific combinations of runes resulting in a spell being cast. When encountering enemies that use magic though, most notably the Lich, it's possible to see them drawing runes themselves before casting an attack, and those combinations of runes actually correspond to spells the player can use themselves. I've talked about stim and response before, but just to summarize, certain things in the game are marked as stimuli, or stims, which, when objects in the game come into contact with, execute their response to that stim if they have it. For instance, oil puddles, oxygen tanks, and phantoms all have a response to the fire stim, even if those responses are different from each other. If you want to know more, I do a more thorough exploration in my video on Thief 2, or you could just watch Mark Brown's video that came out three months later, and it's better because it's like a quarter of the length. Ooh, look at me. My name's Mark Brown. I'm a well-adjusted adult that makes good content. Jesus. But this idea of using enemy abilities as stims that the player can obtain for themselves is pushing this idea further, and it opens up a new set of strategic options. For instance, Thermal Phantoms have an ability where they can shoot a jet of fire from the ground, and because of this, the ability is a fire stim. So the player can research Thermal Phantoms and purchase that ability for themselves and have access to a source of fire whenever, or they can try and trick Thermal Phantoms into setting things on fire for them. Having both the player and enemies pulling from the same pool of abilities that affect objects in the same way goes a long way towards making things feel grounded, and to have that interface with the research system is just, ah, that's so good. Plenty of skills are still visible from the get-go, however, including those that enable weapon upgrades. Throughout the game, the player can find weapon upgrade kits. Dragging it onto a weapon in the inventory reveals that all upgradable weapons have four attributes that can be improved, with each weapon upgrade kit providing one point to invest in any of these facets. All players can invest somewhat in improving their weapons, but in order to be able to fully upgrade them, they'll need to invest in the gunsmith or lab tech skills, depending on the weapon. Another handy skill to have is repairing. There's a number of mechanical objects in the world that can be damaged, or may have already been broken by the time the player enters the area. With the repair skill, players can use spare parts they find to restore them to their functional state, things including turrets, operators, and grav shafts. Oh, okay, that one's a bit on the nose. For turrets and operators, there's a certain point where they're destroyed and can't be repaired again, but if the player has the dismantling skill, they can loot a spare part from them in order to help them repair things in the future. The player can also find materials for crafting, obtained by picking up objects in the environment and putting them into recyclers located throughout the game. These materials are split up into four types, organic, mineral, synthetic, and exotic, which is like alien matter. These can be used at fabrication stations, which use different quantities of different types of materials to create objects the player wants. Before creating an object, the player needs to find its fabrication plan while playing, Though that includes a lot of things from medkits and ammo to basically all weapon types. A couple of implications of this system are pretty cool. First off, because they're recyclable, all items are still useful to the player even if they're redundant. 
See, in System Shock 2, the player got a wrench at the beginning of the game, which doesn't degrade with use like most weapons do, so when they see another lying around the environment later on, there's absolutely no reason to pick it up. In Prey, however, other wrenches that the player finds still have value because they can be converted into mineral and synthetic material. The other implication is that just by looking at any object lying around, you can kind of intuit what material you'll get out of it. For example, banana peels and flowers will generate organic material, whereas plastic tubing is handy if you're running short on synthetic material, though trust me, you're not going to have that problem. You can also intuit the materials required to craft something, like how medkits need organic material, or how exotic material is used to create neuromods. The last basic thing we should cover are chipsets. These are upgrades the player can find in the game that can be installed in a screen in the inventory, providing them with a bunch of passive buffs to certain abilities. They're broken into two groups. Suit chipsets, which the player installs on their suit, and scope chipsets, which they install on their psychoscope. The player has a limited number of slots for these, so they start out with only being able to have two of each type active at a time. Though this amount can be increased by purchasing the psychotronic skills for sculpt chipsets or the suit modification skills for suit chipsets. Problem is these passive boosts aren't very interesting or well organized. So for example, the scientist skill tree is where the psychotronic skills are located, allowing for more scope chipsets to be installed, and skills in the science tree tend to focus on psi abilities and research. Actually, a prerequisite to the psychotronic skill is the psionic aptitude skill, which increases the player's psi points from 100 to 150. Given this, then, you would think that scope chipsets would support a player trying to utilize research and psi as part of their playstyle, right? Well, most do. There's a chipset called Speedscan, which reduces the amount of time it takes to research enemies, and certain chipsets increase damage dealt by specific psi abilities, but then there's the Mech Tech chipset, which increases the speed of repairing things? Similarly, you'd think that the suit chipsets would deal with the player's movement or what they're protected from in the environment. And while there are some that provide resistance to fire and radiation, the Cell Refurb chipset lets the player collect more ammo for certain weapons from broken robots, which, um... What does that have to do with my suit? Calling them passive is also only partly true. For instance, one of the first scope chipsets in the game is called Mimic Detection, which allows the player to see mimics when their psychoscope is deployed. This isn't modifying or improving a behavior the player already had, it's giving them a completely new one. It seems like some rules were attempted to be followed when coming up with the effects of these, but because they're broken so often, there's no meaningful reason as to why a chipset is on the scope or on the suit, or even what differentiates a chipset from a skill the player can unlock. As such, I've found chipsets to be kind of interchangeable and forgettable. So, with all that ground covered, let's start digging into the implications all these systems raise. Besides a couple of small issues here and there, I've been effusively praising this game because it does a lot of things right and it seems to really get what an immersive sim is. But I still felt like I was removed from the experience, that I wasn't really understanding the world of the game on an intuitive level. So, um, I'm gonna have to do a lot of clarifying here, but I feel like I wasn't... immersed. No, 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 hang on, hang on, let me explain. I know immersion has come and gone already as a euphemism for good graphics so that marketing executives don't sound repetitive on stage at E3. It's no secret that we love gaming. We love the immersive worlds. Our immersion into the gaming experience at every touch point. Continue to dream of a more immersive and innovative experience. The tech that the next-gen consoles really allow the player is immersion. 100% immersion. The thing is, though, we all kind of understand it's a real phenomenon, right? For a moment, you forget you're sitting at your desk or on the couch, and you start to think in a way as if you were in the world yourself. I mean, obviously you're not really, but there's a difference between saying, let me move my character forward within the range of this keypad and hit the interact button so that I may enter the room on the other side, and let me open this door. There's been some attempts to describe what immersion is, and yet we've never really gotten a definitive answer. 
except um, you know, two people wrote a, a master's thesis almost a decade ago that put forth a really good argument, and uh, I'm just gonna like uh, repeat it here. In their thesis, Beyond the HUD, User Interfaces for Increased Player Immersion in FPS Games, Eric Foggerholtz and Magnus Lorentzen spend a section actually trying to come up with a definition of what immersion is. However, they don't come up with a definition. They come up with two. The first they refer to as immersion through perception, which is similar to the colloquial good graphics argument, but also includes things like lighting and physics behaving as expected, and objects having appropriate and expected sound effects. But the second definition is what I want to focus on more, immersion through reasoning. Foggerholtz and Lorentzen argue that a game world in which players are encouraged to use their knowledge of the real world and knowledge of genre conventions to solve game world problems enables the player to reside in a fictional frame rather than a rule-oriented frame whilst playing. Basically, if the player is able to make decisions and actions while thinking in terms of the fictional world of the game rather than a memorized set of rules the game provides, that's when immersion through reasoning happens. For instance, in Thief, the player has access to water arrows as a tool and can use them to extinguish torches. However, they can also be used to extinguish fireplaces and power down steam-powered robots if you shoot them on the grate to their furnace. Because of this, the fiction of the world in Thief states that water quenches fire. If water arrows only doused torches but not fires, that would be immersion breaking not just because there's no fictional justification for it, but also because it creates this weird condition of water quenches torches but not fireplaces, forcing the player back into a rule-based mindset. The underlying rule that Foggerholtz and Lorentzen state, then, is that the rules of the fiction need to be consistent in order to foster immersion. Saying water quenches fire is more consistent than saying water quenches only certain sources of fire. Rules don't necessarily need to be realistic, either, they just need to remain the same. The authors provide the example of Superman. If Superman can lift a blue truck, it's expected that he could lift a green truck as well. And this need for consistency in rules is why stim and response is such a powerful tool. Not just because it provides a way for developers to manage the complexity of interconnected systems, but because it makes objects react the same to stimuli present in the game world. Stim in response literally puts the immersive in immersive sim. So if Prey is using Stim in response, and quite effectively, why does it still not feel immersive? This suggests that its immersion through perception is lacking. Perception doesn't deal with rules of gameplay, but if I may provide a bit of my own interpretation, I think it still deals with allowing the player to think in terms of the fiction of the game. So looking through this lens, Let's talk about Prey's UI, and why there's all this goddamn shit on the screen. The rest of Foggerholt and Lawrenson's thesis actually discusses user interfaces, mostly focusing on the specific type of heads-up display, or HUD. Before they even get to the introduction of the paper, a section on terminology is provided, with the two defining HUD as any transparent display frequently used to simultaneously display several pieces of information, such as the main character's health, items, and indicators of game progression and goals. HUD here is specifically referring to UI that's drawn in screen space, meaning that it's drawn on top of the screen after the game world has been rendered. But I'd venture a guess that the point of any type of UI is to communicate information about the game's state. There's plenty of obvious examples to choose from. The player's health bar communicates how close they are to dying, an ammo count communicates how many rounds the player has left in a particular weapon, a crosshair shows where the player is going to hit if they fire a weapon, etc. Of course, UI isn't the only way to communicate information. Art, animation, lighting, and sound can also be utilized either individually or in synergy. But the point is, if you're going to have a piece of UI in your game, it needs to tell the player something. But going back to that idea of immersion coming as a result of communicating in terms of the game's fiction, you can start to see the issue with screen space UI specifically. Fictionally, why is it there? 
this gets into diegesis, which I brought up in my System Shock 2 video for like uh, 20 seconds and then dropped completely. Yeah, that could have uh, that could have used a second draft. Uh, briefly, something diegetic exists in the fiction of the game, whereas non-diegetic elements don't. Praise health bar, non-diegetic, as there's no explanation for it. Ammo counts for all the weapons? Turns out they are diegetic, being displayed on an LCD screen built into the firearm itself. So if you're trying to foster immersion through perception in your game, it might be smart to minimize the amount of non-diegetic UI displayed. You don't need to eliminate it entirely though. Thief has health and the player's visibility displayed at all times, and sometimes a breath meter if they're underwater, but I still think it's pretty damn successful at making the player feel immersed in the game world. Prey, on the other hand, has a health bar, an armor bar, a psi bar, a flashlight icon, and gauge, a crouching Point icon, of interest icons, markers, and status markers, effects, enemy an icon for the gauges, ability, an enemy health bar, bar icon, damage icon, indicators, a bar for stamina, a bar for the jet for I feel like it's a bit overkill. And looking at a lot of these items, critically, it becomes apparent that a lot of them are unnecessary. Having a notification appear saying the player's picked up a weapon upgrade kit might make sense the first time it happens, but every time? Like, I know I picked it up, I had to hit F to do so. Same goes for audio log notifications. These UI elements are unnecessary because of the way the player has to opt in by performing an action to pick them up in the first place. And not only are there unneeded UI elements, there are UI elements that make others completely redundant. Again, if the player gets a notification for every item they pick up, including weapon upgrade kits, then why have this weapon upgrade kit pop up? I would also think that no UI would be needed to communicate whether or not the player is crouching, because the camera movement would do that just fine. As it turns out though, when the player is crouched, there's this black overlay on the top and bottom of the screen, which I think is really distracting, but there's also this little crouching silhouette on the top of the player's health bar. So there's two pieces of UI here to help communicate something that most games do without needing any. The overlap between UI design and level design in a game might be minimal, but it's not non-existent. You know I like talking about lighting and initial reads because they're tools to help the player understand spatial layouts at a glance and because I uh, like pretending like I know what I'm talking about sometimes. But the most important aspect of an initial read is that the player can actually, you know, see it. As small an issue as it is, if the game is rendering a bunch of icons on top of everything else, this can block or distract from the read, preventing the player from getting a full sense of their surroundings. I know this argument might be a little far-fetched, but I found myself feeling like I didn't have a good sense of the layout of the levels, and like I was having trouble navigating. Eventually I tried looking at disabling a bunch of UI, but found Prey's options very lackluster. Bemoaning this fact on Twitter, however, someone responded and pointed me in the direction of the Prey Interface Customizer, a mod someone made so that players can selectively disable UI elements as they see fit. To paraphrase an argument made by one Harris Bomber guy, if players mod something out of your game, that might be a bad sign. Uh, though if I can add a punch in here real quick. In the middle of editing this, E3 happened, and uh, at E3, it was announced that Prey was getting a free update that coincided with the release of its Moon Crash DLC. So in the free update, there's a lot more options to uh, customize UI, and there were actually revisions to specific UI elements. So I just want to acknowledge real quick that Arcane didn't seem 100% happy with this UI either. Uh, so they did something about it. Unfortunately, disabling parts of the UI was also frustrating because it became apparent that waypoints were needed to actually find important areas and items. This was kind of misleading because the levels themselves seemed to be built to be navigable without it, with signs in the world pointing towards the various entrances and exits. But for main quests where the player needs to find an unremarkable item, or go to some secretive cranny in the exterior of the ship, the design of these levels doesn't really make those stand out, so god help you if the UI isn't on to tell you exactly where the objective is. To wrap up systems though, let's talk about stim and response again, but more specifically what stimuli the player is given to use at what point. The idea of immersive sims is to create a world with a bunch of objects in it that engage in consistent behavior, 
Explosions ignite flammables, water quenches fire, electricity damages machinery, etc. Because of this, objects and stimuli in the environment become tools the player can use as opposed to most shooters where the abilities of the player, mostly different firearms, are only acting on enemies in the world and the occasional explosive barrel that was very deliberately placed. I mean, hey, shooters are really fun, but they typically end up having their worlds be passively engaged with because the focus is solely on enemies. Because Prey wants the player to pay attention to their environment and utilize what they find, it makes sense to give the player a healthy number of tools to act on the environment with. However, because of the skill trees, Prey also wants a certain number of these tools blocked off, perhaps because certain tools are too powerful for the early stages of the game, because the designers want the player to have long-term goals to work towards, or because finally unlocking these give the player a sense of progression and empowerment. Because of this though, tools that are intended for all players need to be accessible without obtaining any upgrades. And because this is an immersive sim, there are certain ways systems overlap in the game that are either unforeseen by designers or are there as some sort of esoteric secret as to how the game can function. For instance, something I didn't pick up on immediately are all these red pipes throughout Talos 1. Sometimes the player will enter the environment and they'll already have punctures in them, with jets of fire being emitted. My first instinct was to just plug them up with a glue gun, but after a few hours it finally hit me. Can't I create those punctures? And sure enough, you can. Because of this, I realized that these pipes that had been interwoven throughout the environment that I had only been half paying attention to because of the UI had a use and made me see levels in a different way. But that's an example of a secret interaction between tools all players have, those being a pistol and pipes in the environment. There's other system interactions the player can discover, though, that are dependent on purchasing certain upgrades. For instance, if the player obtains the Mimic Matter ability and disguises themselves as an object, Mimics can actually come up to the player and copy the object off of them. I mean, I don't know how useful that is, but it's really cool. Leaving these as secrets for the player to discover is really impactful, not just because it lines up with that definition of immersion through reasoning, but because they get that emotionally impactful moment of, oh, of course that's how that works a moment which the player is going to remember your game by. But because of this, there's a certain tension over what tools the player is given access to and what tools are not communicated and left for the player to discover. In other words, how many explicit tools do you give all players, how many explicit tools do you lock behind skill trees, and how many do you leave as secrets for the player to find? because, at least for me, it really felt like in the beginning of the game that players had access to a meager amount of tools, leaving me in that frustrating reliance on glue gun, wrench, pistol. And furthermore, I was just using these directly against enemies instead of using them with the environment itself to indirectly engage with enemies. So why did I end up forming that strategy, and how did the game lead me to developing it? It's time to get into the guts of this and look at the first level. Uh, you'll need subtitles on for that pun, by the way. The player wakes up in their apartment, receiving a call from their brother, Alex Yu, informing them to get to the roof of the building and get in the helicopter that's there. The player can loiter around their apartment for a bit, pick up some objects and read some bits of text, but when they're ready to go, they first need to put on the suit hanging on their front door. Going through the hall to the left, the player passes a friendly maintenance person, then enters an elevator and prompts it to go to the roof. Going out and to the left, the player reaches the roof, gets in the helicopter, and experiences one of the snazziest intro sequences I've ever seen. Landing on another building, the player enters a room, encountering the first operator in the game, not that it really behaves like any of the ones later. It instructs the player to take the elevator behind them to the appropriate floor. Arriving there, the player sees their brother Alex standing next to a reception booth. Approaching him, the player gets a scripted sequence explaining that they'll be engaging in some tests. As it ends, a door to the right opens up and the player walks through into the first test chamber. These few rooms are pretty on-the-nose tutorials, but given that the fiction is that the player is literally being tested, that's kind of appropriate. 
To get to this point, the player needs to have figured out how to pick up objects and interact with objects in the world, but in this first test chamber, they're taught that objects with physics can be picked up and thrown. The next test chambers teach the player how to crouch and jump over certain obstacles, all the while being ushered through by the doctors on the other side of the glass. In the last room, the player encounters a diegetic computer terminal, which will be a very common sight in the rest of the game. While looking down at the monitor, something seems to move on the other side of the glass. When Dr. Bellamy here asks about his coffee, it violently transforms and latches onto his head, introducing the player to the mimic. They're then sedated, waking up again in their apartment. Putting on their suit and opening the door again, the player sees the hallway lights are now dysfunctional, indicating that things are very different. Unfortunately, it appears that the maintenance person is no longer among the living, but the player is able to commandeer their wrench. Of course, once you give the player a melee weapon, the first thing they're going to do is whack everything in sight. There also appears to be a wall where the elevator once was, but a balcony is visible through the apartment window. Maybe there's a way out there? As the player picks up the wrench, they receive a call from someone named January, explaining that they need to escape the apartment and come find them. All these forces combine to make the player want to break the window, revealing that the player isn't in a high-rise in San Francisco, but on the set of a fake apartment somewhere. Alright, so, um, uh, Arcane Devs? Okay, well, first off, great job on the game. I know you wanted to reference a bunch of immersive sims, and I know Harvey Smith worked on this one. You really don't need to bring up Invisible War. Stepping through, the player's in this lowered area next to a computer desk, receiving another transmission from January, explaining that they're in something called the Simulation Lab. Looking at the computer next to them, the player finds out the call they received from Alex after waking up was a recording, with some emails going into greater detail as to how this simulation was carried out for so long. This area wraps around the whole apartment, but to the right of the broken window is a room with a locked safe in it, and a whiteboard with the code erased just to antagonize the player. Going left from the broken window and wrapping around is a storage room, with a mimic hanging around here that the player could encounter. Both paths eventually lead to where the first elevator was, connecting to a room where it's evident the helicopter ride was faked. Going through the door on the other end, the player enters back where they met Alex. The room to the test chambers is locked, though the player can unlock that via the monitor at the, uh, reception desk. The door behind there is open though, leading to the room where the doctors conducting the tests were. In the second test chamber, a mimic is visible, which can take the appearance of the chair in there. The player can either smash through the glass or sneak on by, but the light behind the door frame on the other end beckons. Going through, the player goes up some stairs to the second floor, wrapping around the set of the apartment. Ahead is the door to the office area, though a side area is off to the left. If the player goes here, they'll encounter another mimic, and can play around with the helicopter room's settings if they want. Going through the door, the player goes through a decontamination chamber, but a scripted sequence plays, showing an employee getting devoured by a mimic, it splitting up into four mimics, and then all of those going to hide right before the door opens. How comforting. Moving into the office area beyond, the player is prompted with a giant pop-up on the screen, explicitly saying that the room has more than one solution and basically gives away that they can either use a keycard to open the locked door on the other end, or climb up a piece of machinery to open a vent along the right-hand wall. From this point, the player can go to the right and right again to enter Dr. Bellamy's office and grab the simulation lab keycard, though a mimic is hiding in this entry area among the stools. If the player wanted to go through the vent though, they'd go forward and to the right, then mantle onto this tape deck and open the hatch. There was also a mimic here for me. I'm not entirely sure if there's specific points level designers place for the AI to flee to, or they're very good at evenly spacing themselves, but it seems that the player is going to have to deal with a mimic on either path, which I think is good. If the player unlocks the door, they'll be in front of a window through which they can see the first phantom they'll encounter, January informing them of the enemy type's name as the player sees it dash away. The vent from the previous room also leads here, and there's a door to the right, but it's locked at the moment. A lamp knocked over and some footprint decals to the left trace the player's eye to around the corner. However, there's also this piece of machinery with that prominent ass UI element of a wrench next to what looks like a broken elevator. If the player walks up to it, they see that it can be repaired, but they don't have the required skill of repair one yet. Huh. 
Now isn't that interesting? Following the footsteps, the player sees what looks like a mimic frozen in place, with a deceased crew member laying there among a giant mess of... some substance. Seeing that it's a mimic though, the player whacks it and kills it. Behind where it was, the player sees and picks up their next tool, the glue gun. Not only does this area effectively communicate the multiple uses it has with the mimic and the chunks of glue frozen on the walls, but it also showcases some great environmental storytelling. This guy came over from where the player was, presumably because the mimic looked like that overturned lamp, and latched onto him. He stumbled for a bit, shot his gun erratically, and ultimately lost. What's also great is the overturned tape drive on the left wall here. Because of its angle, it creates a line pointing to a corpse hanging off the security booth, drawing the player's eye towards it. If the player climbs up, they'll also have to climb over or smash this bit of glue, communicating not only that glue can be mantled onto, but if the player keeps an eye out and takes the high route, they might be able to find some rewards in the rafters. If the player passes the security booth on the ground floor though, they'll pass a keypad, but unfortunately, it's locked. Hey, it says I can open this with hacking one. As the player approaches the lobby, a flock of mimics come out of a room on the side. January, however, directs the player's attention to the neuromod display across the way. However the player gets there, there's a few mimics in here, so odds are the player's going to have to deal with at least a couple. Going up the stairs, the player may also notice the entrances to the bathrooms on the left. The men's room looks blocked though. God, if only I had leverage one so I could lift these conveniently stacked crates. Hey, didn't you forget to make that joke in the last video? Enough of these distractions though. The player smashes the glass and takes out the neuromod, with the game automatically opening the neuromod menu for them. And gosh, look at all these skills I can buy with one neuromod. Repair one, hacking one, leverage one. Hey, wait a minute. The players already encountered obstacles that all these skills could circumvent. What a coincidence! Oh yeah, I guess there's also a physician one. This is something I really like about this level, that it antagonizes the player with a bunch of places that they can't get, but very clearly states a particular skill could enable them to get through there. The particular obstacles as well were chosen to correspond with several entry level skills that could all be purchased with the one neuromod also provided. And actually, one of my favorite things about this area is that the top of the security booth is actually a great place for the player to use the glue gun to get to the second floor, without relying on any skill tree abilities at all. Whatever skill the player chooses to unlock, if any, January will give a small quip giving some explanation as to the potential uses of that skill in the future. I think it's worth pointing out a couple of things players may pass by on their first time traversing this area. First off, if the player gets up to the second floor, they can pick up the Disruptor stun gun. I'm going out on a limb here, but I'd imagine most players don't get up here until after they return to this level later. It seems like the designers banked on this too, because it would be a weird place to introduce a weapon that's more effective against robotic enemies when the player hasn't encountered any yet. The rest of the doors up here are all either locked and require a keycard or higher level hacking to open, or blocked with objects that require leverage above level 1, effectively containing the player. Just past the security booth on the first floor and to the left of the entryway is a room with a projector in it. Nothing much going on there, just some more stuff to loot. To the right of the entryway is a door to that room where the phantom was introduced, but that's locked as well. Eventually, when they're exhausted of options, the player will go to this bulkhead and enter the lobby. Going through reveals a hallway that bends off to the right, with a corpse right in front of the player to provide a couple of items. Going through the arch onto this balcony, though, reveals that the player was on a spaceship the whole time. To their left flank is a path leading to the door of human resources, though it's blocked by a bunch of heavy obstacles, providing some on-the-nose symbolism. To the right is a stairwell down to the first floor. As the player turns left, they can see an explosion out the window in front of them. Turns out that occurs at Hardware Labs, where the next mission takes place, and the player will actually be moving around the wreckage there. After this, January contacts the player and instructs them that they need to find their old office in the lobby there, though a pop-up states that the player is free to explore. Focusing on the direct path though, the player will probably head down this hallway, then look to the right to see a map in front of the elevator at the center of the room. 
Looking at the directory, some offices are shown to be on the third floor, those being for executives and the CEO. The player can continue to the other end of the floor, making their way towards the stairwell via the left or right paths, or even through this Transtar exhibit area on the right, showcasing the history of the company and where the player can snag a second Neuromod. There's a number of mimics around the area at the base of the stairs. Depending on the path they took, though, the player may have already encountered a turret set up across the way. Most paths the player takes will alert mimics and have them move closer, bringing them into the range of the turret, showing that, oh hey, turrets will fire at the Typhon. How handy. Unfortunately, if the player goes through the Transtar exhibit, it's entirely possible that they'll engage with all the mimics there out of range of the turret, meaning the player might not have that knowledge. There's a turret on the third floor right outside Morgan's office that might also help, but it's not guaranteed that an enemy will follow the player in there. Going up the stairs, a trash can slowly rolls down, with one suspiciously standing on the second floor landing, which, quite predictably, is a mimic. Both doors on this floor are either locked or blocked entirely, so the player progresses to the third floor. On the left is the door to teleconferencing, with a transparent pane letting the player see that a pistol is there. Unfortunately, this one's also locked, so they turn around to enter the executive offices. Around the corner is that turret I mentioned earlier, but Morgan's office is locked. The player then investigates their secretary's computer, either hacking in or obtaining the password from the sticky note on the monitor. Reading the only email on the computer, the player finds the key code and enters it, and it's an 0451 reference! Entering to the right, the player sees the main area, with Morgan's desk on the far end with three neuromods and a keycard to teleconferencing there for the player to pick up. There's a side room as well, where the player first encounters a recycler and fabricator, and where they can pick up the keycard to Morgan's suite when they enter the crew quarters map later. Approaching the computer, the player hits a button to play a video file. The lights go down, but there's a glow that appears from behind, prompting the player to turn around and see a newly revealed screen. The video starts playing, and it's... them. Tough day, right? If I'm talking to myself, it must be. The Morgan on the recording explains that January is a backup of their memories, meant to guide the player, and that Alex was keeping Morgan in that endless cycle of having neuromods tested on them and removed, making them forget everything that happened after they were installed once they're taken out. Oh boo-hoo, my brother was keeping me captive and started injecting alien abilities into my brain and all I got was a private office on a spaceship. Fuck you. I do your job for half your fucking pay. I don't have health insurance. Morgan tells the player that they have a plan of action, but at that moment the video stops because the server crashes. The Looking Glass server. Oh, that's the uh that's the name of the technology. Uh that's uh that's a bit heavy handed, yeah. Alex calls the player and tells him to stay put, explaining that he can't have them watch that video for reasons he doesn't want to get into. January, on the other hand, gives the player other ideas, saying they should go to the hardware labs and restart the servers themselves. Fortunately, that keycard to teleconferencing unlocks the path, unless the player wants to get a bit Cirque du Soleil. Assuming the player is acrophobic, they exit the office and turn right back to the stairwell, with the door to teleconferencing in front of them. Hitting this point, another huge pop-up appears, explaining that using objects in the environment is advantageous, but that using the glue gun to freeze enemies before fighting them would also work in a pinch, as if they hadn't taught you that already. Turns out this was a pretty big fucking hint, because when the player opens the door, four mimics appear. The player can always run back to where that turret was placed to help fight them off, or they could have already repositioned it if they're savvy enough. The player then goes back through and picks up the... Wait, hang on. I knew it! The player then picks up the pistol, then goes through the other end of teleconferencing, taking care of any lingering mimics. There's this glass bridge that goes across to the other side of this lobby, but the path to hardware labs is actually around the corner to the left. Going through this room with a disabled recycler, the player sees a bunch of dried glue in front of the bulkhead, implying that there were attempts to secure this area. Smashing through, the player activates the door to the next map, and at this point it's probably safe to say the intro is over. 
I should briefly mention though that the player has their first encounter fighting two new enemy types in Hardware Labs. The Corrupted Operator, which gets up close to the player, shoots fire, and explodes shortly after being killed, and the Phantom, which the player has seen before, which can zip side to side, attack the player up close, and charge up a kinetic projectile. Though I should note that if the player did cross that bridge in the lobby, they could preemptively engage with a Phantom in the sales division rooms. Because of this though, the only enemy type the player is guaranteed to have encountered in combat up to this point is the Mimic. And it's a pretty understandable decision because its behavior is fairly basic. It can disguise itself as objects in the environment, and if the player gets too close, it'll jump out and attack them, though it also has the ability to flee if hurt or discovered while camouflaged. But what tools has the player been given up to this point to interact with enemies? A wrench and a glue gun, with the pistol introduced at the very end of the intro. The best approach in the beginning is to freeze enemies with the glue so they can't attack, and then follow up with a couple of whacks. But how does this strategy work with the next two enemy types introduced? Freezing operators works pretty well, causing them to fall to the ground. However, in order to use the wrench, the player needs to close the gap with their target, so when they finish off an operator, there's a good chance they'll be hurt by the explosion. The case with the Phantom is even worse. They take a lot more glue to freeze, but until the Phantom is completely frozen, it can still charge up a kinetic blast and fire it at the player. While firing the glue gun, the player also moves more slowly. While this can be improved by upgrading the weapon's handling attribute, dodging to the side, especially in the beginning of the game, becomes less of a possibility if the player's in the middle of freezing the Phantom. If completely immobilized, the player can get up close and get a couple of hits in, but this is even less of a possibility once the thermal and voltaic phantoms are introduced, which deal damage to the player if they're within their proximity. So when players go through prey the first time, why does this pattern of behavior develop? And why is it that players have a hard time getting out of it? Turns out this idea has been somewhat touched on before by H Bomber Guy in his video on Bloodborne. In it, he discusses the issue of players in previous Souls games engaging in a suboptimal strategy of clinging to shields, and he coined the term play conditioning to describe the process by which players form these habits. Coincidentally, at my day job, we showed off the first level of the game we're working on a couple of months ago, which is supposed to both teach the player about systems in the game and instill what designers on the team have been referring to as player habits. Watching people play this level for the first time at PAX East, I started noticing something interesting, and I feel like I need to stay vague here to be safe, so please forgive me. Let's say a level has Room A, which has a skill gate, ensuring that the player needs to use an item they pick up in the room to perform Behavior A in order to progress to Room B. Room B, however, is meant to teach the player about Behavior B. What kept happening though is that players would complete Room A with the item they picked up, enter Room B, and then immediately assume that they needed to use the item to perform Behavior A again. As soon as you teach the player something, getting them to not use it so that you can teach them something else becomes its own obstacle. So it seems like looking into how habits are formed would be a good idea, which means I need to do... Research I'm not reusing from a paper I wrote in college. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Jesus. Yeah, this better be fucking worth it. How Habits Are Formed, Modeling Habit Formation in the Real World, was published in 2010 in the European Journal of Social Psychology. In its intro, the authors draw upon previous research to define habits as behaviors that are performed automatically or unconsciously, often in response to a cue or signifier. As part of the study, volunteers were asked to choose one of three behaviors to turn into a once-a-day habit, eating a piece of fruit, drinking a bottle of water, and walking for 15 minutes. The participants were also asked to law whether or not they performed the behavior and complete a survey as to how easily the behavior was to perform each day, with a higher score indicating the behavior was more automatic. Graphing the results out over time, the study shows that the more people perform a behavior, the more it approaches the point of automaticity, making it more of a habit. 
What also shows is that the first few times performing this behavior are the most crucial in habit formation, with drastic increases in automaticity happening early, and slowing down in an asymptotic pattern later on. Lastly, it showed that more complex behaviors are harder to make into habits. The participants who drank a glass of water each day were more likely to keep the behavior up and have higher automaticity scores than those who agreed to eat fruit or go for a walk. So, thinking back to the tutorial, what was the first tool the player was given? A wrench. Prior to entering the office area, it was possible for the player to encounter three mimics, though all of them can be avoided easily. Entering the office, four mimics are present there, and odds are the player is going to have to deal with at least one or two. After that, the player encounters their first frozen mimic, smashes it, then gets the glue gun, their second tool. Going through the lobby then are five more mimics, meaning that there's a potential eight mimics the player can encounter when they only have the wrench, and another five when they get the glue gun. Because the first few times a person engages in a behavior has them gain the most automaticity, the player's halfway to making the glue gun and wrench combo into a habit at this point. If players learn something in room A, they're going to want to take it into room B. There's another finding the study found though. The authors kept track of instances where subjects reported that they hadn't performed the behavior one day, but performed it the next three. Looking at these instances, the authors found that skipping a day didn't have much impact on the behavior's automaticity going forward. In other words, failing to perform a behavior has a negligible effect on long-term habit formation, meaning once someone has a habit, it's really hard to shake it. And here's the point of frustration. Prey starts introducing enemy types for which the glue wrench strategy isn't compatible, either because the player takes damage if they're within close range, or because the player moves too slowly while using the glue gun to avoid attacks. Essentially, the game is punishing the player by damaging them for doing what its play conditioning taught the player to do. I'm not sure if any of these enemy behaviors were deliberately designed to shake the player out of this, but as the study found, one unsuccessful instance of engaging in a behavior won't push people out of their habit, so multiple instances of failure seem less likely to make the player step back and reevaluate their strategy, and more likely to just give up on the game as a whole. And that's not to mention that just using the glue gun and wrench doesn't require the player to utilize any objects in the environment, which is kind of what Prey is set up around. Thing is, if you go back and look carefully at the intro level, you'll find that there's almost no objects the player can incorporate in fights, because they can't throw most objects for damage unless they purchase Leverage 1. The only exceptions are three explosive canisters, which can be made to explode by being thrown, but two of them are placed in an out-of-the-way area in the helicopter room, and a third is placed in that vent, leaving the first office area. So if the player just gets the keycard to the door, they'll miss it completely. It's not that the player develops the wrench and glue strategy because the level unsuccessfully taught them about things in the environment they could fight with, it's because it doesn't try to in the first place. It seems that shaking the player out of bad habits then is going to be a less effective strategy than just making sure these habits don't form in the first place. But if Prey is a bad example of this, then what would a good example look like? It's Half-Life 2. Half-Life 2 is good at everything. Before we get started then, we should go over the gameplay of Half-Life 2. It's a first-person shooter. Huh? No, that's it. But it does something really clever. When the player collides with a weapon they haven't picked up yet, it gets added to their arsenal, and it's the first one equipped. This has actually been done before, since about Doom, I think, but it's the way Half-Life 2 uses it that's pretty special. So after an intro of just walking around, the player's suddenly on the run from soldiers, and they're tossed their first weapon, a crowbar. Immediately in front of them are some planks, which they smash, a box, which they smash, and finally a drone that can blind them with flashes, which they smash. The players push through the next few areas by gunfire from enemies, and they end up in a hallway with two soldiers holding a couple of citizens captive. With no way but forward, the player rushes them and picks up the pistol one of them drops. Now, it's obvious to most people what a pistol does, but let's just assume the player is being really weird and is insisting on sticking to the crowbar. 
Smashing through these boards, the player heads up a stairwell with an enemy coming down from above. Because of its spiral shape though, their line of sight is obstructed, so it's easy to get up close and hit them. At the top and around the corner though, the player encounters another guard up a flight of stairs. Even though they're further away, and the player's likely to receive some damage, they can be dispatched using melee. Here though is where things get interesting. The player has to cross a gap by waiting for a train to pass and then jumping to the other side. As the player arrives there though, enemies show up to fire at the player from the other side of the gap. Even if the player wants to bring behavior A into area B, the layout forces the player to learn how to use the pistol. But okay, what if the player gets too used to just using the pistol and crowbar and they don't want to start using weapons that get introduced later? Oh. Oh buddy, you gotta see this shit. Up to this point as well, the player's been rewarded with health and ammo dropping from enemies, and more than likely they've started forming a habit of running over enemy corpses to obtain their spoils. About 20 minutes after the pistol's introduced though, the player goes through this area in the canals and sees a combined soldier rappelled down, with two others emerging from a corner behind them. The player probably thinks this is pretty simple, just kill the first enemy with the pistol, run over him to grab his stuff, and keep firing to take care of the others. What the player isn't accounting for though is that the guy in front has a submachine gun. So after the player kills them and they run over where he was, they're probably going to keep firing as they pick up the SMG. And because new weapons are automatically equipped for the player, they start firing with it before they even realize that they're now using the new weapon. Hey, this isn't toilet paper. But okay, Half-Life 2 is not that complex of a game, and the combat has nothing to do with using the game's environment, aside from the ubiquitous explosive barrels and traps introduced in Ravenholm. What about an immersive sim so that it's a bit closer to what Prey's trying to do? Turns out I didn't have to look very far, because one of Arcane's previous games, Dark Messiah of Might and Magic, already kinda did this. The tutorial level in Dark Messiah takes place going through a tomb, with the player character's mentor, a wizard, providing guidance. The game focuses on having the player engage in melee combat that's more complicated than in most games. The first example of this is when the wizard prompts the player to kick the support beam of a platform. This causes the platform to fall and knock a chain loose, which the player climbs. After obtaining a weapon and breaking through another set of wooden objects by slicing a rope suspending a heavy coffin, the player sneaks up behind their first enemy, a zombie. The wizard, however, prompts the player to kick it down the ledge, claiming that it's a more effective way of dealing damage. The player is then held in that room to make sure they understand how to use a couple of basic attacks. As the portcullis to the next room opens, the player then sees a guard overlooking a ledge. Once again, the player is prompted to kick him over the edge, but this time they see that this shatters the wood. Going down into the pit, the wizard prompts the player to kick the guard into the spikes lining the wall, marked with a glowing white indicator, and doing so nets them an instant kill. The player is prompted to do this a couple of times and is also taught how to parry attacks. The wizard tells the player that they can keep practicing and that he'll heal them, but that he's also opened the portcullis to the next area when they're ready to move on. Now, having a practice area with an endless supply of guards who keep coming out one by one is a bit artificial and gamey. However, this whole training sequence shows what the game prioritizes, introducing the player's combat abilities by having them act on things in the environment rather than the antagonists. It's kind of odd then that Arcane was able to nail this prior, but not in Prey. So how could these examples be applied to Prey's intro sequence? Well, one of the cool things about heavy objects that need leverage to be lifted is that they have physics and can still be affected and moved by certain other stimuli in the environment. As it turns out, a sufficient explosion could move them. So let's say after this room where the glue gun is introduced, Perhaps in this hall the player enters the lobby from, there's a blockade of some heavy objects with some glass framing it so the player can see a bit of what's beyond. In front of the first corpse the player encounters, they see a pistol and pick it up. January could then prompt the player to shoot an explosive canister wedged in between some of the crates and the glass frame, so that they can be moved out of the way. 
On the other side of the glass, though, is a mimic disguised as a box or a cup or something, precariously close to that explosive canister. The player can then shoot the canister, moving the crates, but then they also see the mimic revealed because it took damage, and then scurry away, communicating, oh hey, I can hurt enemies with stuff in the environment. Would plopping this hypothetical encounter into the game as described suddenly fix everything the game does wrong? Almost certainly not. This also runs the risk of having players pick up other bad habits, or, most likely, the idea of the obstacle isn't communicated as effectively as it could be. Who knows, maybe the intro sequence that shipped was a major improvement over its last version. But if I had an opportunity to change this level, I don't, mind you, but if I did, I think it would be worth prototyping this encounter. Sit some players down, have them play the intro up to that point, and then see what they bring into this Room B. Hopefully they'll start playing more in line with what the game wants them to play like. What would that look like? Well, covering two levels turned out to make this script ridiculously long. I don't want to run the risk of having this video be too much at once, and also I'm starting to get concerned I might be uh, disrupting the people in the apartment below me by recording all this VO at once. So let's stop here for now, let this digest, and meet back to discuss Shuttle Bay, hopefully piecing together some semblance of Prey's level design philosophy as we go. Let's hope it's within this calendar year.